Today we're going to do eyes. So the very first step for eyes is to measure visual acuity. You're usually going to use one of these pocket charts. We also can use a wall chart. Um, wall charts are better because you're not limited by a patient's presbyopia if they're an older patient. So um, directions say to hold 14 inches from the person's eye, more or less. So go ahead and read the smallest line you can read. 937826. Alright, and then you the other eye. 937826. Okay, one thing to be aware of in nursing, we're primarily interested in functional ability to see. We're not necessarily interested in um, complete vision. So we don't care if they're using correction or non corrected. We want to know what can they functionally see. So have them wear their glasses or wear contact lenses if they have them. All right, after we do that, we can do a number of assessments. So we can have the patient look at our finger and then we're going to have them follow. And these are called the cardinal direction of gaze. You can do a big H like this. You want to go fairly slow when you're doing it. Because um, if you go too fast as you go across their field of vision, that can actually cause dizziness or a headache. Um, one thing you want to make sure is you get their eyes to the corners of gaze. So all the way to the side, all the way up, all the way down to that corner, and then back to the middle. And same thing on the other side. Sometimes you'll see people doing it like this, follow my finger. They're not getting enough eye range of motion there. Um, the other thing that you can do when you're in this um, when you're in this setting is as you go from one side to the other, you'll probably notice that their eyes have a couple of little beats and that's called nystagmus. A small amount of it is normal, especially going across, but if it's doing it at rest, then that's a sign of something else neurological going on. Next, we can take an ophthalmoscope and the ophthalmoscope, um, this bottom collar does how bright it is. You typically just want to go for the brightest. And then this little lever right here, um, changes the shape of the light. So we just want the big circle. So we want the big circle and fairly bright. And what you can do is just stand back here, shine it in the patient's eyes, and you're looking for where the light reflects off the cornea. This is known as the corneal light reflex. So you're looking for the where the light reflects off of their eyes. And it should be in the exact center of their pupil on both sides. That's what you're looking for. If it, you notice that it's to the side on one of their eyes, that's a sign that their eyes are not converging together. So the patient may have a lazy eye or they might be wall-eyed or cross-eyed. So that's corneal light reflex. And then what we can do is come a little bit closer and shine the light on one eye and you're looking for the pupillary response. So you want to see the pupil constrict. Now she's got dark brown eyes. It's going to be a little bit harder to see than someone who's got blue eyes. And then you can do the other side as well. Now, when you shine the light in this right eye and that right eye constricts, that's called direct constriction. Now, if you shine the light on this eye and this eye constricts, that's called consensual constriction, and that's what you want to see. Now, notice the technique. Watch how much movement there is in my hand. What you're going to see a lot of people, especially when they're new, and the patient, ah! Don't startle your patient. You don't need a lot of movement, just that much. So, looking for direct, looking for consensual, looking for direct, and looking for consensual. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to have the patient focus on our finger, focus, focus, keep focusing on your finger. Now, as you come in closer to the patient's face, two things should happen. One, the eyes should converge, that's called convergence. And the second is that the eyes should constrict, and that is called accommodation. So, um, we learned about this in pathophysiology pharmacology one when a person has sympathetic response that causes the eyes to dilate which makes it hard to see up close because to see up close you need to have acetylcholine which is going to constrict the eye so in order to focus on my finger up close not only do your eyes converge but they also constricted so that's called accommodation the very last thing that we're going to do in this uh, eye exam is we're going to do is the ophthalmoscope to look into the eye and we're going to look at the retina. Now at the baccalaureate level, the only thing we're looking for is what's called red reflex. In this case, it means that the when we shine the light on the back of a retina, it reflects red back at us. And um, this is the biggest use for this is to see if there's an opacity. If you shine the light and it's gray, 
then that's a sign that something is blocking the light getting to the retina, whether it's an opacity of the eye like on a cataract or whether it's a tumor. So we're gonna stand back here and use right hand, right eye, right eye, and you're gonna look for the red reflex. Then we're gonna go to the other side and use left hand, left eye, and left eye. Look straight ahead, please. And look for the red reflex. Now, that's gonna work best in a darkened room. Darkened rooms don't necessarily work the best with our camera lighting, so we simulated a darkened room. Um, the reason you wanna use a darkened room is that will cause pupillary dilation, which is gonna make it easier for you to get that light to the back of her retina. So that is it for the eye exam. At this time, we're going to move on to the ear assessment. So with the ear assessment, there's a couple things that we wanna assess for. The first one is gross hearing. Now, what we mean by gross is just the ability to hear spoken words. So what you wanna do is use your, use your hand and occlude the atragus, push down on the atragus on the opposite ear, and then you're gonna come over to this side. Now, to prevent her from lip reading through her peripheral vision, we're gonna cover our mouth like this, and you wanna say a word that's at least three syllables. Elephant. What word did I just say? Elephant. And then you can do the same thing on the other side. Hospital. Hospital. So we've assessed gross hearing. The next step is we can use what's known as a um, Weber test. For that, you need a tuning fork. So this one is a 512. So you can see it's stamped 512. And then we also have a 256. And then we also have a 128. This re refers to the number of hertz that it's tuned to. Um, for these tests, you want to ideally use a 512, although sometimes it's harder to get them to ring. So for the Weber test, what we're going to do is we're going to tap our, our um, tuning fork and place it firmly on the patient's head. Do you hear that? You don't hear anything. That's one of the problems with the 512 is sometimes no, I heard it. Okay. And where do you hear it? I hear it like in the center. Okay. So what we're looking for with the rubber test is for them to hear it either above their head or equally in both ears. Sometimes like, what do you mean? Where do I hear it? Mm -hmm. That's usually a good sign. If they're like, oh, I hear it on this side or I hear it on that side, that's an abnormal or positive Weber test. The other thing we can do with this is known as a RIN test. So for the RIN test, we're going to come to the patient's side. So for the RIN test, we're going to come to the patient's side. We're going to hit the, and we're gonna come press it against the mastoid process. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Let me know when you stop hearing it. I just stopped. All right, can you hear anything now? Mm -hmm. All right, so what we've seen is that when you hear through the bone, the bone conduction is less, less time, than the air conduction. And generally you won't expect to hear twice as long through air than you would through bone. Um, if you want to know what we mean by bone conduction, what we mean by go bone conduction, hold your ear like this and sing and you hear yourself differently, that's because you're hearing yourself through bone conduction once you occlude that, that ear. Um, so that is the RIN test. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to inspect and palpate the ear and then we're going to look with the otoscope. So we can expose the ear. Is there any tenderness here? And then we're going to place, this is an otoscope. This one is a simple one. It doesn't have anything that you can do besides make it brighter or dimmer. It's usually start with the brightest setting. This is called an otoscope specula, righty tighty. And then we're going to lift the patient's ear up and back. Now for this technique, I'm turning it just a little bit, that, little bit that way, just so that the camera can see. For this technique, what I like to do is place the stethoscope just on the tragus and then rotate it inwards. And then you're going to look. All right, so if you've done this well, it shouldn't hurt the patient and you should be able to see the tympanic membrane. We're assessing the tympanic membrane and we're also assessing the external auditory canal. So the, membra the membrane should be 
they call pearly gray, and you should see the light reflects. You shouldn't see any redness, and you shouldn't see any air bubbles or air pockets or bulging. The external auditory canal itself should be mostly clear and not inflamed. If there's some cerumen in the way, that's not a big deal, but if you see fuzzy things growing or if you see a lot of redness or tenderness, then that is abnormal. All right, now we're gonna move on to the nose. Now, for the nose, mostly what you're gonna do is look into the nose using a light source, and you should use one of these, which is known as a nasal speculum, but um, a, lot of, a lot of sites don't have these. So what is more commonly used, although technically not correct, is just to use your otoscope specula on the patient's nose. So look up, please. Um, not with your eyes, but just with your head. There you go. And so you lift the nose, and look inside the nose. You can get a slightly magnified view this way. If you need to, you can actually insert the specula just gently. Stay away from the central spec, uh, septum. Only use the lateral septum. So you can spread the nair to the side, but don't go towards medial. So you can do that on both sides. And then the next step is going to be to palpate the patient's sinuses. So let me know if there's any tenderness here and here no and there no. you can also palpate them or sorry percuss them any tenderness when i do that no. okay one thing to be aware of if a patient is already tender by by touch then you don't want to go ahead and percuss because they might punch you um, sinusitis really hurts so at this point we've done the nose okay next we move on to the mouth now with the mouth, we're gonna do a couple things. First, we're going to inspect the lips and the teeth, the dentition, and also gums. And then we're gonna look inside their mouth, we're gonna assess their tongue and also their um, throat. So in order to help us, we can use one of these, which is sometimes known as a tongue depressor, but more commonly known as a popsicle stick, which can be used for a lot of different things, including building birdhouses. So um, just relax your mouth for a moment. I open your mouth just a little bit. So what you can do is use the tongue depressor to kind of pull their lips and cheeks apart so you can see their dentition. You want to be a little bit careful as you go across the center. You're not slicing over the membrane, you know, in the middle of their, of their lips. Okay, next, open your mouth, stick out your tongue, and say ah. Ah. Uh. All right. So when she says ah, we're looking at the back of her throat and we're also looking to see where, how the palate and the uvula rise. They should rise in midline together. So um, stick your tongue again and say ah. Ah. Uh, okay. Ah. Ah. Uh, uh. And then also to say light, tight, dynamite. Light, tight, dynamite. Okay, now we're going to assess the head and neck. So when we assess the head, we're looking for a couple things. Um, one thing you wanna pay attention to is the level of the ear connection to the eye. So it, the, where the ear connects should be at the corner of the eye level. If it's lower or higher, that may be indicative of problems such as fetal alcohol syndrome or some other birth defect or congenital um, disorder. You also just want to look at the overall symmetry of the face and you want to notice if there's any um, if there's any problems inside the scalp itself so for this you're going to have to palpate the patient's scalp um, this is a very important if you suspect that the patient has fallen or has some sort of head injury now once we're at the back here we're going to go ahead and assess the lymph nodes so we're going to start with the occipital then the posterior auricular then the pre-auricular slide down underneath the corner of the mandible for the tonsillar and then sorry tonsillar here behind sorry behind the mandible for the tonsillar underneath the mandible for the submandibular and then underneath the chin for submental then there's three chains here here and here so we're going to palpate the anterior chain then the superficial chain, and then finally the posterior chain. Then the last thing we want to do is what are known as supraclavicular. So here's our clavicle. So we're going to go above the clavicle, and we're going to um, use a motion like this while the patient takes a deep breath. Take a deep breath, please. Okay. So by taking a deep breath, it helps push upwards 
push, uh, upwards pressure. So you might not feel one just here, but when they take that breath in, it might push it up so you can feel it. So again, those 10 spots are posterior, sorry, occipital, posterior, preauricular, tonsillar, submandibular, submental, super, um, anterior chain, superficial chain, posterior chain, and then take a deep breath, please, and supraclavicular. Okay, thank you very much. I feel like I must missed something there for some reason. Should we do that again? Okay. Hold on. How do you feel being the talent? Not well. <laughs> I'm only doing this because you guys don't have anything. Yeah. Okay.